Ibrutinib is a BTK inhibitor, and it has been FDA approved in um, a couple of different diseases, mantle cell lymphoma, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Um, but more recently, there's been some data um, looking at this in other lymphomas that have been recently published. So there is a subtype of lymphoma called large B-cell lymphoma, and a group of those patients with the activated B-cell type also respond. And some of that data is very interesting because that group of patients tends to fail other therapies. And so that's really some of the newer developments. Um, the other drug that kind of inhibits this pathway is a drug called idelalisib. And this is a PI3 kinase inhibitor, and it is approved for the treatment of indolent lymphomas like follicular lymphoma as well as CLL. Um, and there, again, been a number of new studies being done looking at this agent and other lymphomas, um, but these are pretty preliminary at this point, and so hopefully in the next couple of years we'll see if there's activity in other lymphoma subtypes with that drug. A number of the newer studies now are looking at these in combinations with traditional chemotherapies. So there's combinations with abrutinib, rituxan, and bendamustine, which are common frontline therapies for patients with mantle cell lymphoma, for example. And as they're studying these and they've been proven to be safe, they're now moving them into the frontline setting. And so they're really good options for patients with, um, who are elderly with mantle cell lymphoma who may not be transplant candidates. Uh, there are other combinations going on with um, CHOP-based chemotherapy, which is used for patients with large B-cell lymphoma, and abrutinib has been proven to be safe with that as well. Um, and this is very promising, again, because of this new data in large B-cell lymphoma showing that this drug is active in the patients with relapsed large B-cell lymphoma. Now we can actually start moving it up front in combinations with CHOP, which is what we uh, typically give for pe people with newly diagnosed large B-cell lymphoma. And these same combinations are also being done with this other PI3 kinase inhibitor, idelalisib. Um, so there have been combinations with bendamustine showing that these are safe. Um, and now many randomized phase three studies are going on looking at rituxan and idelalisib compared to rituxan and placebo, or rituxan, bendamustine, and idelalisib compared to placebo. And hopefully in the next couple of years we'll see is if we can move these newer agents up front for the treatment of patients with follicular and other lymphomas. That's probably the question of the hour and the question that um, nobody really has a good answer for. Um, these agents really have just started being used and we're just now starting to see patients who relapse on them just as single agents. And at least with abrutinib, there has been some um, studies to suggest it's kind of harder to get patients back into remission. But where they have been initially studied are people who've had four or five prior therapies. So it may just be a function that they have fairly aggressive disease. So I think in the next couple of years as we see some of these combination studies like um, the bendamustine and the abrutinib or the bendamustine and idelisib um, or the CHOP combination starting to be done, that's going to be an important question is for those patients who relapse, how do we salvage them? I struggle with this right now in my own practice for patients with mantle cell who are um, failing abrutinib. Um, and I really have not seen any particular drug, I think, that stands out. We've used certainly all the standard therapies like bendamustine, lenalidomide, more aggressive chemo combinations, and they are particularly challenging um, to salvage. So I think hopefully in the next couple of years I can better answer that question, um, but it, I think, is really going to be, you know, one of the focuses of research, you know, that we uh, really need to look into a little bit more. It's through the Lymphoma Research Foundation, and a couple of years, John Leonard, who was the um, chair of the scientific advisory board for the um, Lymphoma Research Foundation, asked me to develop a program similar to what ASH has, um, called the CRTI for ASH, where we take fellows who are really f um, dedicated to research in lymphoma specifically, and we actually have them come to a week-long meeting where they present some clinical trials that they're developing. They get a chance to kind of meet faculty from across the country who specialize in lymphomas, and they help them work with their, their protocols, their projects to really refine them. And then over the course of next two years, we have a couple of follow-up meetings where they get to meet again with those faculty, sort of you know, talk about the progress they've made, made talk about career development types of things, and really, most importantly, talk about grant opportunities. So it gives them ways to collaborate and connect with people from other institutions that help strengthen their grant um, submissions. Um, and it has led to, I think, increased funding for some of these sort of junior trainees. Um, and then, you know, we have them participate in grant reviews, which is um, very interesting because it's something that you don't really get to see when you're a junior investigator. And so it's nice to be on the other side of the table, see grants come in, kind of learn the review process. Um, learn what gets funded, what doesn't, so that again, hopefully it strengthens their grants. So it is in its third year now, um, and um, we usually have six to seven uh, trainees per year, uh, maybe 
nine to 12 applicants, depending on the year. And it's really available through the Lymphoma Research Foundation. If you look at their website, um, applications usually come up in September. Uh, and we review them in November, and the meeting is usually January or February. And then um, once, once you've kind of been accepted, it's a two-year commitment where you um, come to a couple of different meetings throughout, throughout those two years. ASH has had an important role in really sort of um, uh, getting people aware of these drugs and aware of the clinical trials um, that are available with these drugs. So um, the initial presentations at the meeting showing the activity I think has generated excitement which has led to a lot of increased referrals to some of the um, larger centers that are participating in these studies. And now that these drugs are moving into the frontline setting, really sort of multi-institutional studies are going to be critical to getting them done and kind of learning. Um, you know, can we do these safely in the frontline setting? Are they going to improve our outcomes for our patients? And so I think Ash just coming and attending the meetings and seeing the results that are out there, making people aware of the clinical trials that are available has really kind of helped spearhead that process and kind of kept it moving. Mm -hmm.